This is TPI the podcast. Hello, everyone. This is TPI the podcast. I am Abigail Murphy, one of the multimedia reporters, and I am here with Trice Brown, who is also an English teacher hello, and my hello. close friend. Yes, yes, yes. This podcast actually is pairing with a column that I did, which is called Give Classics a Second Chance. So if you start off with the podcast first, feel free to check out the column. Um, But getting right into it, let's hash out our grievances. We're talking Mm. about classic literature. Mm. Yeah. What book did you read for school that you dislike the most? Mm. Mm. See, I have a lot of strong feelings about this one. Um, I teach English. Uh, and I teach ninth grade. And when I was in ninth grade, I had to read a book that I firmly believe destroyed my love of reading for maybe four to almost eight years. Uh, and that book was Wuthering Heights. Yeah, I felt like that's where that was going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I may have told you about Wuthering Heights before. Um, I honestly, uh, a testament to how little I understood of that book and how little I got from it is that I don't even remember who wrote it. I just knew it was a classic. Emily was, Bronte. Emily Bronte. Okay. Um, but it was a book that I had to read over the summer uh, going into my freshman year. Mm-hmm. So you go from eighth grade where you read fun books um, to suddenly I have to read this very long um, book that I understand like none of the context by myself over the summer. Um and so I was done with classics. Um, after that, I was done with a lot of reading after that. It's also because students, like kids who are 14 to 18, they just, they hate reading. They want to yeah. stop doing it unless they're, they're one of the good ones. Um, they, they're done with reading. Um, so that was the one that I disliked the most. But I, over the past few years, I have found my own groove, my own rhythm, and I've been getting back into some classics um, that I think have really done it, done it for me, I think. Yeah, I think with Withering Heights, a lot of times it's not marketed well. I Mm. think it's usually like called a romance, Mm. or at least by like average Joe would call it a romance, even though like it's really not a romance. It's really about abuse. Yeah, it didn't seem super romantic when I read it. Are they like cousins or something? They did grow up in the same house. I I think Heathcliff was adopted. Okay. Now that makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it doesn't really feel like your whirlwind romance that maybe you would hope it would be. Right. And I also just knew so little of it going in. I mean, it's a totally different thing whenever you're assigned reading to do. Like, your interest level is so different. Um, But I would have liked to know a little bit more about it before I had to start trying it for myself. Yeah. Uh, but there are some like classics that I did read in high school that I did uh, enjoy. Uh, when I was in 11th grade, um, I had to read The Great Gatsby, uh, which yeah. I don't know if in Auburn uh, City Schools, if they read that in 10th or 11th grade, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but that book was awesome. Uh, Another classic, uh, but it was a little bit more modern and we were reading it as a class. So I understood a lot more of the context. Um, But I think like the thing that I took away from that book um, was after I had to like write uh, a paper, like doing some kind of analysis of, um, of something about it, Uh, because it was in my AP literature class. Um, I just remember the teacher, I wrote a paper about how in The Great Gatsby, we can see how there is the the world of the new money and the world of the old money and how those two things don't um, mesh together very well. Um, And that's what I wrote my paper on. Uh, And the teacher really liked it. She wrote fantastic (laughs) on the paper and that affected me so much I'm now an English teacher (laughs) (laughs) you just need validation if you have that then you will pursue (laughs) exactly Uh, that's really the trick Um, but I think that classic was something that taught me that you can like learn something from a classic I feel like if if I had to like um, 
look at someone and tell them like some kind of reason why they should not read a specific classic, but be interested yeah. in finding like a classic that they would enjoy. Um, you know, t- to quote uh, Kamala Harris, uh, do you think you just fell out of a coconut tree? No, you exist in the context of all that in which you live and what came before you. Yeah. Um, and so like classics are a way to understand like what the, yeah, like, yeah, there's one like story about this guy who lives on some island um, in New York. I'm remembering so, so little about The Great Gatsby right now. There's a green light. Yeah, there's a green light across the water. Uh, and there, he has a really rich neighbor and like yeah. maybe they're in love. I don't know. <laughs> there's so much to delve into, but like you learn about like what the people were like in a certain time and like how how is that time different than now? How is it similar? Um and that's very valuable, I yeah. think. Um, and I'm reading more classics now. I'm not trying to like uh, go too far ahead. Um, but I think it's, you just got to find the ones that interest you. Yeah. Um, and that's really, that's really what gets it for me, I think. Well, I'll dive into my um, mm-hmm. grievances. The okay, one that okay. I dislike the most yeah. was Lord of the Flies. Mm, and granted, really? I was in eighth grade. Okay. So I think See, I was. I've never read Lord of Flies, but it okay. sounds so good. I mean, I think part of the problem was that I was very young. Right. So right. you know, you might read it, and you might like it, but I okay. found every the char- all the characters very annoying. Mm. I hated all of them except Simon. But the thing about Simon, and that's the one where they're like on an island. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they like crash land and they have to survive, and they're okay. choir boys, and that's significant for. Oh, choir boys! Interesting. Yeah, but you hate Simon. Well, no, I love Simon. You love Simon. Okay. That's the only character that I liked. But the thing about Simon is that he dies. Oh. So he Spoilers. dies. Whoa. Okay, well, <laughs> it's a classic. It's been out for a while. <laughs> but the, okay, it's like okay. he died. And I was like, okay, well, then why am I here? Mm, like the mm. one guy that I'm kind of cheering for is right. dead. And like, he was supposed to die because he's like a Christ-like character. It's like mm. deep. It's meaningful. Like there is a purpose. He didn't ah. just die to die. Okay. But it's kind of like Top Gun with okay. Goose. After Goose died, I stopped watching. I don't mm. know how it ends. I will never know how it ends. because You want to know how Top Gun ends? I don't know how it ends because Goose died and I was like, I'm done. What? Goose is dead. What else is there? Yeah, but like. I know there's more. There's like, more. And there's like another film I don't where know. they like talk but about Goose's Bruce, legacy. I know, but is he, is he there? No, but his child is there. <laughs> okay. Like the I'll, son of Goose shows up in the next Top Gun movie. Okay. Maybe I'll consider finishing Top Gun okay. one day. Yeah. One day. But going back to classics. Yeah. To be fair with Lord of the Flies, it mm-hmm. did introduced me to symbolism okay. on a level that like as at that point in time I didn't really understand because yeah, we, we yeah. talked about it in class we went over like the pig on the stick and how it symbolizes the brutality of humanity and like all of that mm, so like it's a yeah. very deep book yeah um but it was just like I think it was not for me and maybe not mm. for me at that time in my life yeah was probably part of it yeah so do you think that like you would have gotten as much out of um out of that if you had chosen to read it on your own, as opposed to like being walked through by like a teacher? Um, I think having the teacher guide us through mm. helped a lot. Mm. I don't think I would have picked up on any of the symbolism mm. or any of like the deeper messages in there if I didn't have someone mm. walk me through. Mm. So now I guess as I'm thinking as like an English teacher, yeah. as like for listeners right now who are interested in getting back in classic, let's say that they have a classic that they want to read. Um, how do you think that they should like approach that? Do you have any tips yeah. for like taking away some kind of deeper meaning? Well, okay. I have been thinking about that. I feel like one of the things that helps with trying to get back into classics is mm-hmm. audiobooks. Oh yeah. And I love audiobooks. Yeah, and it, maybe it's like you read the physical copy and the, you have the mm-hmm. audio book at the same time, because yeah, like this yeah. year I've been trying to read all of Jane Austen's books mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. like, you know, very old timey language and it's like yeah. the dialogue super long. Sometimes I lose track of like what character is speaking when. Right. So right. having the audio book going as I'm reading it on paper mm. is really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, but also I think that like don't feel bad about like using learning tools. Like maybe you mm. need to spark note a little yeah. bit. Like you read a chapter yeah. and you're like, what was that? And then you just look it up and kind of get 
I've seen right. that. I'm like, I don't think that that like takes away from the classic or like yeah. your ability to read or anything. I mean, you're not cheating. There's no yeah. test you're taking. It's like you're end. learning. Like you yeah. should use learning tools to help you. Mm, I like that. I'm trying to think, um, what are some other things that I think would help approach a classic? Um, ooh, uh, I'm thinking about like how to pick the classic mm, right yeah. now. Um, if you're ready to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, I think that as I've been thinking, like, how am I finding classics? I think a lot of it has to do with like, what books have you read? that you enjoyed and ask yourself questions about those. Like, what is the setting of this book? Yeah. What are the characters like? What are maybe some of like the themes or the big ideas, some kind of message that you can take away and find something that fits within the same, um, the same field. And let me give an example of that. Yeah. Uh, so one classic that I did not mention that I did read in ninth grade that I did love, uh, was To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, you're so basic. I know it's so <laughs> basic, but Scout is such a fun character. Yeah. It's like 14 year old tomboy mm. protagonist. Like, how could you not love that book? Uh, and the next book that I'm reading, the next classic, the, the classic that I'm currently reading, uh, is, uh, the heart is a lonely hunter by mm -hmm. Carson McCullers, uh, which is Carson McCullers is also a Southern author uh, raised in Columbus, Georgia. Okay. Uh, localize so <laughs> localize author. Um, but one of the main characters of that book is a 14 year old tomboy. Um, I think 14, maybe a little bit younger, but it's still like a Southern small town setting, uh, in like the 1940s. Um, so you get kind of like the same vibes, yeah. um, yeah. as that. So it's familiar and it's fun. Uh, the story itself is like different and like the themes are different, but I had that kind of like familiar thing that I could kind of hold on to. Yeah. Um, and I think you're kind of touching on this, but like, I think people forget that there's genres within classics. Right. Like, right. It's like classics is not a genre. Yeah. Cause it's like, I'll go into one of the ones that made me realize that I might like classics, mm -hmm. which is Frankenstein, which mm. is within the horror genre or sci-fi genre. Right, so right. I've noticed that a lot of the classics that I read tend to gear towards horror or mm -hmm. sci-fi or something like that, or kind of darker tones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, aside from, you know, the Jane Austen that I'm reading. Right. But that one, I just felt like I really connected with, it was very character driven basically. Mm, mm. And it's so different from any movie that you would watch of mm -hmm. Frankenstein. Uh, I thought that like the creature, which is also like Frankenstein's monster, his side of the story and reading yeah. that, that I was super immersed in. I think I read the book in like, three days because I was so into it. And it was actually assigned reading too. And remind me about Frankenstein. Are you reading from the perspective of Frankenstein's creature? Or who was like the narrator in that? Okay, it starts with Victor, okay. the scientist. Right. And then there in the middle, you get the creature's perspective Ooh. where he starts to tell like his tale and his side of things. He's telling it to Victor, I believe. Yeah. Is, like, the context I was supposed to read this book and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now you can go back and read it, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it should, I think it ends with Victor because it starts okay. with him in his old age ish, mm. like years later, he's in the Arctic. Okay. Some ship. And yeah. Cause ends, he's tracking him down. And then he ends with, <sighs> the arctic again so it's a nice framing story oh i like that yeah. i do want to go back to that point that you just made that um classics is not a genre yeah classics are just like really good vert like examples of yeah. a genre so maybe the answer is figure out what genre you like the best i think i definitely fall more into like the sci-fi speculative fiction kind yeah. of classics that's how i really got into ursula k le guin um, I'm going to take a few moments to yeah, talk about okay. how I love her. So Kayla yes. Gwynn, um, amazing author. I love the way that she writes about like just anything. She has like this really unique background. Um, like her dad was an anthropologist. So she like, I don't know, that influences how she like approaches her stories and she great world building. Um, but she has a lot of like, um, classics within the fantasy, uh, being a wizard of Earthsea. Um, and the sci-fi genres, like her books, like The Dispossessed or The Left Hand of Darkness. Um, and I love those books and I'm a lot more engaged with like the idea of a classic because I 
know something that I like, you know, and yeah. I've given it a shot and it's worked out. Um, so just keep your eye out. I think, um, I don't think that the best way to find a classic is to just like type in your computer classics to read. Yeah. Um, but if you ever see a book and it says classics on it, zoom in, you know, mm-hmm. um, bookmark that for later. Um, as you like steadily grow your collection of classics that you are aware of and maybe something that may interest you. The one that I most recently read that I really enjoyed was The Bell Jar mm, by Sylvia Plath. Um, yeah. It's so moody and okay, okay. sometimes I just need that. Yeah. It's also, of course, very lyrical writing because it's Sylvia Plath. Okay, okay. So, I mean, I love the I writing style. So um, it is, again, pretty dark. So like definitely look at trigger warnings for mm. that one. Mm. Um, but it's also kind of on the shorter side. It's like 230 pages or so, Mm -hmm. and it is a modern classic. So you don't have Mm. as much of like the, oh, what on earth is this word? Or like, why is it spelled that way? Like with Jane Austen's, it's like choose is spelled like C-H-U-S-E. And I, until I listened to the audiobook, I was like, I don't know what that word is. Yeah. So it's like, it's nice that it's a more modern classic. It's a little bit easier to read. Um, another one that I would say is like a good one to start with maybe mm-hmm. is The Hobbit, which some people say is a classic, some people don't. I feel I like, feel like surely I it's feel a like classic. it is. Like yeah. in my opinion, it's a classic. But you know, like I like it more than the Lord of the Rings series because mm-hmm. the Lord of the Rings series is so focused on the war and the political nature. Yeah. yeah. And the Hobbit is just a little quest story. And mm. I'm like, that's more of what I like. Yeah. Rather than more of like war kind of Yeah, this books. bird's eye view. Yeah. You have to like cover and everything. And it's only one book. Yeah. Right? Like you yeah. don't have to do a whole series. That's and you're another already kind of familiar. Of classic. Yeah, you're kind of already like familiar with some of the stuff if you like have ever seen Lord of the Rings or mm-hmm. anything. Mm-hmm. So that's another reason because it's like, okay, no one knew what an orc was when Tolkien first wrote that. Like he created yeah. that. But now it's like kind of popular and like the social side guys or whatever. Like, you know what an orc is. A side guys, I like that. Yeah. That's <laughs> big words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do love that. Uh, um, about like when you, when you really get back to a classic and you, you understand like how this, um, more common trope comes together. Yeah. Yeah. Like I believe, um, a wizard of earth state by Ursula K. Le Guin is the first example of a wizarding school. Oh. Um, in like the fantasy genre. Um, so it's funny to see like how the, those things started and how they become very different as like other people put their own spin. Yeah. So it didn't start that. with Harry Potter. It did not start with Harry Potter. No. Um, it started with Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, remember that. Another classic uh, that I have enjoyed recently um, is Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. Okay. Uh, that one uh, is about this man who lives in Paris. He's like an American living in Paris. Uh, and his wife that he like kind of maybe loves yeah. uh, is away in Spain. And he is meeting this friend of his named Giovanni. And then they start to like develop a kind of romance. Um, and then <sighs> wife comes back. It all blows up. Yeah. Um, but I just liked the the small ways that uh, he uses, like, language, like, the verbs that he uses and, like, the dialogue. Yeah. Um, but that's another example of a classic that um, is more modern. It's not, like, 1850s. It's, like, 1950. Yeah. Um, so I was a lot less confused um, as I was reading. And it just it feels more important to me yeah. if it was only 50 years ago as opposed to 150. Yeah. Well, I mean, since we both kind of had more modern classics, mm-hmm. is there a good 1800s-ish novel that you would be like, oh, oh gosh. maybe that would work as a starting point? Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to go even farther back. Uh, okay. If we're really talking about classics that are good, Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. That is my favorite Shakespeare Me of too. all of them. I mean, I teach Romeo and Juliet, and Romeo and Juliet's good, but none of them do it like Twelfth Night. Uh, so pin in that. Oh gosh, eighteen hundreds novel. Mm, okay, 
One that I read okay. at the beginning of this year, The mm-hmm. Picture of Dorian Gray <gasps> by Oscar Wilde. That is a good one. Another dark one. Yeah. I don't know why I only read dark things. Maybe it's just that century. <laughs> maybe. <you know>? Maybe. <laughs> but it's so cool because it's like you have like this theme of decay. Yeah. And I thought that was really intriguing. I really, it's I like read kind it. of magic a little bit. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I guess it's like magical realism-ish. Maybe. I, I mean, kind of. I don't really know exactly what that means, mm, mm. to be fair. But. Yeah, I think, like, magical realism is, like, treating magic as if it was real. Like, you you okay. make it seem, like, natural okay. in the world. Well, then, yes. I would, yeah. I think it would fall under that. I would say, I'm not going to say what the ending is, but I think right. it's one of the best endings. Mm. And it's not, like, a happy ending. At yeah, all. yeah. Um, and I think that's an example of, like, a classic that you can read, and then you can start to recognize, like, that pattern mm-hmm. or, like, similar ideas in, like, popular culture Again, not giving away the ending, of yeah, course. Yeah. Um, but it does feel very relevant. Like, the problems that that character faces in the book are similar to problems yeah. that people face now. I mean, it's about vices. Yeah. And, and like, giving into that. And, like, youth. it does... Yeah. And also, it's, like, it's an example of, like, a morally gray character. It's not yeah. a likable character. And, like, right. it's cool whenever you get to read a book that has that. Yeah. Oh, I, I love characters like that. What is... Um, a classic that you are thinking about um, coming out next. Okay, there is one that my former roommate just recommended to me. Okay. Um, Undyne. Undyne? Yes. I'll just read what it says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Captivating tale of love, myth, and tragedy that will enchant readers who crave romantic and mystical journeys. Mm. It also is like fairy tales and folklore themes and part of a like romanticism yeah kind of wave and i haven't read a lot from that time period or that viewpoint so i'm very intrigued by that and it's only like 130 pages i love a good short classic (laughs) yeah i love the the romantic and mystical journey like adding that fantasy in there yeah the book that i was thinking about that i am very um excited to read whenever whenever that eventually happens um is a hundred years of solitude um oh, I by have that on my list. gabriel garcia marquez apparently he's also written love in the time of cholera which is a title that i'm familiar with of love and other demons so maybe if you already have an idea of a classic that you've read and you enjoyed try to find other things that they've um Written. Yeah, true. Um, follow the author. Yeah, follow the author. Uh, follow the time period. Follow mm-hmm. the genre. Um, finding a starting point always makes things easier. Yeah. Any last minute thoughts on classics that you want to give to the world? Don't force yourself. Um, if you don't like it, you don't like it. Uh, yeah. Reading is supposed to be fun. Yeah. Uh, don't be afraid to give up on something. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah if you don't like a book you can set it down you can set it down no one's gonna get mad at you yeah. uh you're not gonna get a zero uh and i'm i'm an english teacher i can tell you that you do not have to finish the book um but be willing to start it yeah. and go to your local library yeah. uh there's so many good things there you'll be exposed to a lot more than if you're just like in your room trying to like think about what's a classic book <laughs> Make a part of the time in your day to read. Yeah. Like, go sit outside, um, get away from a screen, and just read for an hour. Or, like, before you go to bed, um, turn your phone off or just put it away and read until you get tired. That, that's the key. Yeah. Making it a part of your every day. Well, I mean, I think that was well said. We'll go ahead and give it a wrap, more or less. Um, but once again, thank you for is, having me. Yes. Please. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of this. TPI The Podcast is a production of TPI Media and brought to you by TPI Digital. It's all about the audience and whatever your marketing needs, we can reach that audience. To find out more, go to tpidigital.com or click the link in the show notes.